Good morning, friends. Happy Monday. Yesterday, I laid out the premise that we are bold in God's service when we live into the kingdom of God, and that living into the kingdom of God is lifetime work. It is our faith and our practice. In addition to the references in Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount, that I suggested offers us insight into how to live into the kingdom, the Apostle Paul wrote letters to believers in the early church that gave advice, encouragement, and admonition. Actually, that was Marty Grundy's suggestion of how to think about constructing Bible half hours. I don't pretend to be, have the eloquence of Paul, but in his letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, verses 22 to 23, he describes the fruits of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And here's the translation from the message. But what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives, the same way that fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. Today I want to tell you about my view about how Quakerism can give us confidence in public witness. As friends, we have our testimonies, we have a history rich with momentum for social justice, peace, and sustainable living. We have practices of self-reflection, and we have ways to use our presence, our physical presence, both in expectant listening and in vocal ministry. I think of friends' testimonies as manifestations of the kingdom of God, and that these testimonies, peace, truth, community, equality, and simplicity, can also offer disciplines for daily living. This is my experience. My intentionality to live into these testimonies helps define my spiritual state dedicated to God. Quaker testimonies guide us and offer a language for bringing some of the shared experience of friends. And I know that uh, some are critical of relying on testimonies as kind of a shortcut to talk about Quakerism. But I invite you to consider how Quakers appear to those who are searching for spiritual connection, those who don't know our language. The SPICE acronym can actually be pretty useful um, for those who are outside the the sort of realm of Quakerism, for the, what I would say, the curious, the lurker, the seeker, those who are really wanting to kind of be, find out more. Um, And even for those of us who are still in our own spiritual formation and Deepening our understanding of these testimonies can enrich us. So this morning I'm going to give you a little bit of perspective of a biblical connection to the testimonies. And because there is such richness and depth in the Bible, I invite you to uh, consider how you might continue looking at testimonies and uh, biblical connection in your own study or in your communal Bible study if you choose to do that in your meeting or churches. I guess we're mostly meetings here. I've gotten used to talking when I talk to Quakers to talk about meetings and churches because there are obviously a lot of Quaker churches too. The Bible verse that I selected to talk about peace is the one from Psalms 34, 14. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Truth. If you love me, keep my commandments, 
and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. John 14, 15 through 17. Community. This from Romans 12, verses 9 through 21. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Several verses in both the Old and New Testament speak to the idea that God shows no partiality, which to me is the testimony of equality. And in the commandment from Mark 12, 30 to 31, in which Jesus instructs us, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And yesterday we spoke to the verse on simplicity, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. In addition to these testimonies, Quakers who are alive today are, I believe, within the long procession of friends. We can acknowledge and understand the stories of these friends as inspiration to us, and they are foundational to where we are now. And we can also hold up the mirror of self-reflection to consider how the kingdom of God is alive in the society today. The Religious of Friends, of course, has a rich legacy in social justice. Friends' leadings to address injustice was an indication of an inward condition, a condition premised on the covenant of peace, the presence of love. From advocating for religious freedom to the work of abolition of slavery, for suffrage for women, our reputation as a historic peace church opposed to war and violence, Friends have labored both within the religious society, turning inward to teach and instruct, as well as outward among the public to witness for peace and justice. Quaker history is written significantly, significantly by our witness to the power of God's love in the political maelstrom. We were founded at a time of foment and dissent. Many suffered imprisonment for their religious beliefs. Our Quaker ancestors came to this country seeking religious freedom. And from the earliest days, Quakers lobbied and did civil disobedience. British friend Elizabeth Fry, who probably is best known for her prison reform work in the early 19th century, was quite clear on the basis of her labor. She said, I look not to myself, but to that within me that has to my admiration proved to be my present help and enabled me to do what I believe of myself I could not have done. Note how clear Elizabeth Fry is about where that courage comes from. She did not count on herself, 
but that within me, the still small voice, the divine, the light. In yesterday's evening worship to conduct business, we heard the active examination by the challenging white supremacy working group of the ways in which we who are white, including Quakers, have used privilege of whiteness, wealth, and social standing for power over the lives of other people. This introspection is important and healthy for our religious society and for the society at large. You know well that the heart and soul challenge that this work gives to us. It is happening with friends in meetings around the country, as well as in other majority white faith traditions. I know, <coughs> excuse me, colleagues in the Episcopalian, Lutheran, Methodist, United Church of Christ are all looking at how their conditions have led to a normalization of white culture in Christianity. The Catholic bishops will soon issue a letter on racism, and even within evangelical churches, there is a great deal of turmoil. We see leaders stepping forward to confront what Jim Wallace calls America's original sin and the ongoing sin of racism. This self-examination, the soul-searching, repentance, requires our emotional and communal labor. I am really encouraged to see how predominantly white churches are recognizing the work they must do to deconstruct the white Christian church as the normative. I also want to take note and thank the New England Yearly Meeting Healing, uh, the Committee on Racial, Social, and Economic Justice for the Healing Racism Toolkit that you've put up on the website. We've shared that uh, with staff at the Friends Committee on National Legislation and have used different aspects of that toolkit and find it incredibly valuable and I commend it to all of you uh, to use in your meetings. One way that we at FCNL have been involved in confronting racism uh, came uh, as a result of an a inquiry from Representative Barbara Lee of California who had reached out to a couple of faith leaders and asked to have a dialogue uh, with faith leaders about the nexus of racism in public policy as it related to addressing programs that um, federal funding that helps support people who are poor, people who are low income. And her concern was that there really was uh, sort of a racist overview to some of these policies. And so we began convening uh, some dinner meetings. The first one was at the Quaker Welcome Center, and the next one was in, uh, at a uh, AME church on Capitol Hill. Um, but these meetings have brought together faith leaders to really confront our own uh, work in policy and our own churches in terms of what we may do to look at um, how these uh, initiatives, these, this legislation that's being proposed would eliminate funding for vital programs like SNAP benefits, job training, housing assistance, and other vital uh, federal funding that undergirds the financial support for children, families, and elderly who need assistance. Another way that friends have been faithful and that I think is one of the strengths of our tradition and our practice as Quakers is our willingness to assert moral leadership. Now, this question of and the use of the word moral is not an easy one because I think that we often are hesitant to assert that, uh, feeling like it may be um, a judgment and we are often hesitant to make judgments over others. But I would say to you that at this moment in time, we are a country hungry for moral leadership and that Quaker voices are uniquely suited to this era. I believe our country is facing grave risks due to the current president. I'm very concerned about a number of public policies, but I will share with you on a very personal level that is the failure of the moral, compassionate leadership that I find extremely challenging. The willingness of the President of the United States to lie day after day, to bully people who work for him, the media who covers the White House, international leaders who have been allies, 
immigrants, women, people of color, people with disabilities. Well, you can name pretty much anyone other than himself. They have all been the target of his antipathy. But what do we have to say about that as Quakers? I had a conversation with a friend uh, last week, a, a very um, weighty Quaker, a friend who's been very important to me, and she said, I am really struggling to pray for this president. I am really struggling to find that of God in Donald Trump. I challenge you to do that. If we believe that God loves every person, that is every person. We cannot make exceptions. Quakers are well regarded in society. If people know anything about Quakers, that is people who aren't Quakers, it's usually pretty positive or it's at least neutral. Sometimes it's even enthusiastic. Um, I have met uh, elected officials, uh, had a conversation with a senator once uh, after a breakfast, who, sa who uh, a senator from Delaware, who was absolutely enthusiastic about the work FCNL was doing because his children went to a Quaker school and he felt it was such a great education. We are known for integrity and truth-telling. We are known as a people who can listen in a deep way, and we are willing to be in relationships, even with people whom we disagree. How are we doing this? Well, you all can tell stories about it, but I ask you, are you using your meeting houses and your encounters with others to demonstrate how you see that of God in every person? I believe that Quakers also have um, a gift of, of voice, not just our silent waiting and our waiting worship, but we have a gift of using our voice and using our presence. When I started working at FCNL, I went through a transformation in my experience as a friend. I had been active in my monthly meeting, participated regularly in this yearly meeting. I enjoyed friendships and socializing with people in my meeting, many of whom are here today, and it's a joy to see them. I appreciated Sunday worship and often felt the power of the Spirit in ways that I found difficult to put into words. I had also participated in a few other Quaker activities, um, an FGC consultation and the gathering one time. I was on the advisory board of the Earlham School of Religion. And um, I value always uh, my time with friends. But coming to FCNL to serve as the head of an organization required me to become public as a friend. I had to learn to explain my own experience, not only to other Quakers, but also to my colleagues at FCNL, well, and pretty much everyone I met. <laughs> um, in yesterday's plenary, I was really struck by Sarah Walton, Adria Gulizia, and Meg Klepak's testimony of the transformation of their lives, the fear and trembling they experienced in being faithful. Now, while not all of us are asked to speak in Bible half hours or participate in plenaries, I encourage you to think about what your testimony is what your story is about how you have been touched, to be able to explain it to others and why you do the work and live the life you do. Let your lives speak is an important intention of the Religious Society of Friends. It expresses the idea that the, that the inhabitation of the kingdom of God will be clear to others by the way we live. And I believe it is also important that we can name and publicly speak to that which stirs us to pursue peace, equality, to live in community with integrity and simplicity. I want to tell you just a brief story about our presence uh, at the Friends Committee on National Legislation on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. Many of you know because you have either visited uh, FCNL, participated in our annual meeting, or some of you have also made contributions that have allowed us to renovate the FCNL office building about 12 years ago and to renovate the building next to us immediately adjacent to the Quaker Welcome Center. 
So the witness that FCNL carried out in renovating that building right on Capitol Hill was that we made it a green building. It was the first LEED certified building on Capitol Hill when it was finished in 2007. Of course, it's not the only one anymore, but it was very innovative and, and really was a witness to our testimony for an earth restored and for sustainability. There was a moment that I, before I came to FCNL where they considered leaving that location and going to another location because of cost. But our presence in being there in that space is a constant reminder, um, not only because people come in and out and it's easily accessible for us to be on in the Senate office building and House office buildings, but also because we use the side of the building as a billboard. Um, to, to put up our messages like love thy neighbor no exceptions or war is not the answer. When Pope Francis visited Washington DC we had Quakers welcome Pope Francis. <laughs> Last year we expanded our footprint uh, with the opening of the Quaker Welcome Center. It's a newly renovated green building um, which is adjacent to FCNL's office. In this building, we have space for friends to attend lobby trainings and events, both in person and thanks to technology digitally from homes. We also host a time of weekly silent worship and reflection. And we hold this space for you, for anyone who needs silent waiting. Quaker advocates who want to come on the Hill to pray, to learn, and to share their stories with Congress. So every Wednesday from 5.15 to 6 o'clock, we have this time of, of what we call silent reflection. And we chose to call it silent reflection rather than worship because the term worship doesn't mean the same to everyone. And a time of silent reflection is something that people who are busy um, and live on Capitol Hill or work on Capitol Hill can truly appreciate. And we have, in fact, had uh, staff from congressional offices come over and spend time in silent reflection with us. Um, actually, there are a number of staff who have some kind of connection to Quakers, sometimes from childhood, sometimes from adulthood, and they have appreciated the opportunity to be with others in that silent waiting. In May, a group of seven people came from Pittsburgh Friends Meeting, traveling to meet with their representative, Michael Doyle's office, asking him to co-sponsor the No Unconstitutional Strike Against North Korea Act. These friends came to the Hill to voice the peace testimony that Quakers have held in our hearts for 400 years. The spirit of Christ by which we are guided is not changeable, so at once as ones to command us from a thing as evil and again to move unto it. And we do certainly know and so testify to the world that the spirit of Christ, which leads us unto all truth, will never move us to fight and war against any man with outward weapons, neither for the kingdom of Christ nor for the kingdoms of the world. After the lobby visit, the group from Pittsburgh joined in worship with FCNL. One friend noted that witnessing and participating in this work firsthand gave him a deeper and fuller understanding of how being a friend resonates with the work that we are doing on Capitol Hill. In Parker Palmer's book, Healing the Heart of Democracy, he says, for those of us who want to see democracy survive and thrive, and we are legion, the heart is where everything begins. That grounded place in each of us where we can overcome fear, rediscover that we are members of one another, and embrace the conflicts that threaten democracy as openings to new life for us and for our action. We live in a time when it is easier than ever to talk to Congress, to speak truth to power. Advocates can travel to see their representatives in person, to, you can go to local offices, take action over email and social media. You can program their numbers into your mobile phones so their members are just a call away. The idea of opening our hearts is the basis of how we encourage people to talk to members of Congress and their staffs. We see time and time again how this engagement inspires hope and empowers change. Tomorrow and the next day, I want to tell you a little bit of some stories, share some stories of how that has happened with friends across the country who participate in advocacy teams. But what I want to leave you with is this. One of the benefits of 
being part of a national organization is that it's not just New England, <laughs> that we are engaging with friends in North Carolina and Oklahoma and Tennessee and Louisiana and Florida and places that um, it's not as easy to have these conversations. And there are friends and friends of friends that are doing this on a regular basis. I also want to acknowledge that while I am, of course, a huge proponent of engaging with elected officials as a way to testify, I do know that there are many ways that we express our public testimony to the kingdom of God. And I believe that many of these are complementary with one another, and I am grateful for Friends' faithfulness to do this.